wow, we've got we've got some people joining. We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, maybe Instagram, but I'm not too sure. Uh, really excited to bring you some really exciting content on sales coaching. Actually, something that we've we've used tremendously in our business has helped us grow, and uh, and hopefully will help you grow. Um, but please, before we do any of that, dial in the uh, or put in the chat where you're calling from, what you do, what your business is. Are you an entrepreneur? Are you uh, at a startup, a small business? Would love to hear it. Um, we've got Canada. We've also got another. Edward is also calling from Canada, I believe. Edward, am I right? Are you calling from London or Canada? Yeah, I'm uh, live from uh, from Toronto here. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Where else we've got? We have got. I think we've just got Canada in the chat, but I'm sure we've got other people from other places uh, dialing in from all over. Um, very excited to start and uh, bring you some insights that we've been using at Apprentice. And, and I'd love for you guys to take what you can and apply it in your own businesses on how you can coach a sales team. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started and bring you some. Let me know if that works. Here we go. Here we go. And boom. Here you are. Secrets to sales coaching. Um, what we're going to cover. So we're going to cover number one, how to make an internal sales training program that actually sticks, that actually works. It's actually going to bring you more sales in your company. We do some live sales call feedback. So we're actually going to be reviewing a live sales call and providing live coaching on this webinar. How to make that shift from sales manager to sales coach. So how can you be that coach that your team wants you to be instead of being that manager that maybe people don't want you to be? How can we facilitate sales coaching conversations that really empower your reps to close more deals? And again, we're going to do some live coaching on this webinar. And some time for some Q&A. So who are we? So these are your hosts. So I'm Sam. Uh, I lead uh, our sales and revenues at Apprentice. Um, I'm also a co-founder with Oliver, who I'll introduce on Celebrating Live. I actually started this business while I was an apprentice myself. Uh, working at Apprentice. So I was an apprentice at Apprentice. Now I'm leading Apprentice. And uh, Oli, if you would like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Nice to meet everyone. I'm Oli, sitting in London. Um, here is the head sales coach and coaching up and training the team. Um, and super excited for the webinar today. I'll pass to you, Savannah. Yeah, so my name is Savannah. I'm the Sales and Partnerships Manager at Apprentice, and I am calling in from Rhode Island right now. Yep, uh, and I'm Edward. Um, I am the Account Executive um, at Scenario. Um, yeah, really looking forward to today um, and learning more about the, the webinar here and um, getting involved in some live sales coaching. Super duper. So, coaching. And the first question to ask is, why is coaching so important? Um, we're definitely seeing this happening a lot more now where people are starting to realize the effectiveness of coaching. And um, really what coaching is about, is about empowering your sales reps to improve on their own skills. And in turn, what really matters as a business is being able to close more business. And what we've found and what studies have found is that those that really optimize and use um, sales coaching in their businesses um, perform at a much higher strength than those that don't. I think many companies are still used to the traditional sales management systems um, that might still exist to this day, um, but we're really starting to see that coaching, um, which I'm going to dive into in a lot more detail, can be really an effective tool that you can use to improve your sales abilities, both for yourself and for your team. So when I think about a sales team, I like to think of it kind of similar to a football or a soccer team. You've got your club owner, that's your CEO, right? So they're managing the entire business. You've got your head coach, which is like your VP of sales, they're delegating and assigning to the right coaches or quarterback coaches. Um, and then your offensive coordinators are really like your sales ops. So they're the kind of people that are sitting there on those sales recordings, analyzing it in the same way that you're analyzing those game recordings, seeing what's working, seeing what you can improve, really taking a tactical and strategic um, position on, on your sales. You've got your specialty coaches, that's kind of like your SDR team leads, managers, sales coaches. Then you've got your captains, which um, might not necessarily be the managers, but they're definitely mentors, they're team leads, they're people to aspire to, people to learn from. And then right on the ground, you've got your players, which are your AEs and SDRs. 
So the reason why I tell you this is the role of the VP of sales, um, in my opinion, the role of the entrepreneur or the CEO or whoever is leading sales is to design the processes that the sales team follow to generate results. That is to design the processes that the sales team follows to generate results. And then the role of a coach is rather than to take that sort of in the ground management role, um, where you maybe you're micromanaging or you're sort of taking control over every element and having that very subjective view on what is going on is to take an objective approach, right? Help your sales team meet their goals as if you would do hiring an external coach into your organization. Now that can be very tricky, but it's also very, very important. And the goal of a coach is to really help enable your team to become process and not results driven. Now that might seem counterintuitive and you know, I, I, we see that on a lot of job roles and job specs for account executive and sales positions is be results driven, be results driven. And yes, results are very important. Results are what you measure, results are what uh, produces revenue for the business, but it's the processes that are really important because when you follow the processes, you train them on those processes, they're going to get the results so long as those processes are correct. So we train them on the processes, we coach them on the skills, and we motivate them on the activities, how many dials you make, how many emails you send out. So when we're looking at coaching um, in comparison to training, coaching is a lot more collaborative and, co and training is a lot more directive. And when we're looking at the sort of the matrix between your motivation and your proficiency, it kind of determines the amount of training and coaching uh, or directing versus collaboration that we involve. So for example, let's say someone is very, very high in motivation, but very low in proficiency, they're going to take on training very well. They're going to put in the work to train, to learn. If they're lower in, um, in, um, in proficiency, but they're maybe higher in motivation, then we need to empower them uh, or direct them rather. We need to direct them on what to do. And if they're in higher in both, we want to empower them to make their own decisions, to make their own shots. And similarly, we want to counsel and perform them when they are low in motivation, high in proficiency. So training is about driving uh, learning and controlling the process. Coaching is a lot more around using conversation and, and questions to enable that collaboration in growth. And I'm going to pass this over to Ollie to dive a little bit more into training. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to mute my my mic. Thanks, Sam. So with training, what we found really, really successful at Apprentice um, is, is really being consistent. We document absolutely everything. We have sales training guides. We have playbooks. We have scripts that we constantly update. We use Loom to screen record training. Um, and then we also have all our apprentices and sales team go through a certification. So they become qualified with Apprentice in the sales process. Um, and really, there's there's a big difference with training and then versus coaching. When we train, we're teaching people skills, we're teaching them processes. And when we're coaching them, we really want to empower them to facilitate their development. They coach themselves, they become their own agent, um, and they're really in charge of their own growth. And I think the key thing is, is it has to be fun, right? Training, if it's boring, people are not motivated and they're not going to develop. You've got to make it fun. Theory, have it practical exercises. We do role plays, we do quizzes, um, we even give away prizes as well. So we really want to empower people to win um, and then make sure they're turning up and, and having fun. We also have accountability buddies. So my team, we've got 10 sales reps and we match each of those together. And um, so they have an accountability buddy. They check in with them twice a week. And really that's so they can coach each other rather than myself or somebody else coaching them. When they coach each other, um, they can be direct because they're both at the same level. It's not like their manager is uh, or manager or coaches here to here teaching them and they're both at the same level they can evaluate each other provide really really good feedback um, and what we want to do is create a coaching culture within the business if people can coach each other it empowers a great culture where it isn't just the people at the top and we'll come on to this a little bit later but the right hand side what we have is a accountability log um, this basically is sort of like a check-in that we do with calls. So what did you do well? Where were you most stuck? And then partner feedback as well, asking them what did they do well? What could they have done differently? And really empowering them to have action steps that they can use to improve on. 
We also have um, a shared calendar, which is really, really successful. So any time within the week, we want as many people in the sales team to actually jump on other calls that are taking place. They can learn, they can give feedback, they can pick up things that they may not be doing in their pitch. And we do this with Google. Um, we have a Google shared calendar. The minute somebody books a demo, it comes up on the right-hand side and you can click in, join the Zoom link, and you know who's taking calls anytime during the week. And then finally as well, so Scenero.ai, which is uh, the very exciting tool we'll be talking about and sharing today. And um, we use this to watch every single one of our meetings. So good meetings, bad and unsex uh, unsuccessful meetings. And then the rep gets access to this about 30 minutes after. So we can measure the call's performance, how much the sales rep was talking compared to the actual prospect, and, and really dig into the opportunities and, and also play it back with the team as well. And it allows them to coach on the performance of the rep, but also provide team feedback um, in a pretty good culture and environment. Awesome, and I'll pass it over to you, Eddie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for, for us at Scenario, um, we can utilize it in a number of ways, but we find, um, especially with the analytics, um, we're very much um, focused on that kind of consistent coachability piece. So we can look at the way that we're executing our meetings and we look at, look and look at things like uh, sentiment breakdown, speaker breakdown. So in my call, am I speaking too much? Am I not speaking enough? Um, am I making sure that I'm engaging that other person by not dominating the call? Um, we can take a look at energy levels as well and pacing. So, you know, as the language I'm using and, um, you know, the way I'm coming across in the call, is it, is it um, you know, high energy? Is it low energy? Um, and especially when it comes to tone as well, um, we find that when, uh, you know, ourselves or clients are using Scenario um, with those external calls, they want to make sure that they're using, um, you know, a conversational um, tone of voice as opposed to maybe using a monotone voice, uh, monotone voice because um, people may not be as engaged in the call, whereas being conversational, you're making sure that you're asking questions, you have that back and forth dialogue. Um, as well as also you can see at the bottom here, the filler words and the pacing. So for me, these are two things that I definitely look at um, in my calls. Um, I know that before I uh, joined Scenario and started using Scenario, I was using way too many filler words. So I'm really conscious about that now uh, to bring my filler words down. So things like, uh, you know, um, like those kinds of words. By minimizing those, I'm making sure that the dialogue I'm using in my meetings um, is more productive. Um, and it's keeping that engagement as opposed to kind of stumbling and mumbling in your calls as well. Um, and also with the uh, with the pacing. So again, I was very much one to uh, speak pretty quickly um, in my calls and meetings and in general life as well, to be honest with you. And especially working in North America with, with a British accent, it can be sometimes, I'm sure Sam, um, Ollie, you may uh, reside with this. It can be difficult um, when I'm speaking far too quickly um, for, for people to understand. So I really made sure that I dropped my pacing down to that, um, that good level and not speaking too quickly quickly um, or too slowly. But really, um, I'm a strong believer as well that whether you're, um, you know, uh, entry level SDR, or you're right at the top, um, a CEO of a company, there's always room for improvement, especially when you're having those, um, those meetings, um, and you're, uh, you know, in conversation with with anyone in your team, or an external call as well, by making sure um, that you are constantly improving. Um, and this is what the the analytics part of Scenario can do for you. Thank you so much, Eddie. So what we're going to do now is actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we're going to do some live live coaching. So we're actually going to take and dissect uh, a sales call that, that Eddie is is has has done and completed. And Ollie, who is who is our coach uh, sales coach at Apprentice, is going to offer some um, coaching, which we're going to go into a little bit more again just after this call. But I'm going to hand it over to you, Ollie, and to take it from here. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. So um, live coaching. Here it is. Eddie had provided this call um, today, and this is obviously Scenario. 
I'm going to just hit play from here, 2303. Um, and typically when I would go into live coaching, there's one or two points I'm going to cover. I'm not going to cover the entire call because uh, Eddie will be here forever and he probably won't take too much of it in. So I'm going to hit play from here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Edward, for contacting me on LinkedIn. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That no was uh, that was a great presentation. So you did it really well. Uh, I can tell you that I'm really interested uh, mm -hmm. to try at least. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we receive the email. Yeah, of course, no problem. As I say, I'll um, I'll set you up the accounts now. Um, if you give me about half an hour, um, I'll send them straight over to yourself, and I'll send one to you as well, Phil. Um, and then you'll be you'll be ready to go, ready to use. And as I say, uh, just just send me an email back with everyone else that you want, mm -hmm. um, and I can set them up an account by the end of the day. No problem. Thank, thank you very much. Everyone. I just have one question. Super. And then we typically jump into the role play feedback log that was shared earlier today. Um, so, Eddie, I guess reviewing that call right now with me, um, what did you think you did well? Yeah, so I think I think with that call, um, I built quite a strong rapport. It was pretty conversational um, tone that I was using, um, was able to create that engagement. Um, and I think as well, the, the pacing and, and tonality was it was at a good pace as well. Absolutely. Completely agree. And, and I actually put that on my feedback. Really good rapport, really good pacing. Um, he actually complimented you at the end as well. He said this was a really good presentation. So um, kudos to you. Um, and and I, so if I was to say, you know, what could you have done differently now you've seen that recording? Um, what would that be? Yeah, I think through through the uh, towards the back end of the recording as well, um, maybe building slightly more urgency, um, maybe uh, setting those next steps for the call, um, you know, working with actual timestamps so we can book in a next time to speak um, and make sure that we're always moving forward um, with going through the whole sales cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, more urgency, setting next steps, booking in another time. And um, really, really valuable because, you know, if you're setting next steps on the call, you're getting them to check their calendar, they'll accept the meeting, and you can come off knowing that you're going to be speaking to them in two weeks time, rather than you having to basically chase them down on email and, and they could potentially run away. Um, and as well as that urgency, that's something you mentioned. So what do you think is one way that you could do to create more urgency in your future calls? Yeah, so I think uh, potentially by introducing, um, you know, asking for a decision by a certain date, um, maybe even looking at things like group discounts and things like that. So you build that sense of um, urgency to, um, you know, be able to close the deal um, and you can work with a time frame and they can work with a time frame as well. And you're both on the same page as opposed to, you know, maybe leaving them to, um, you know, try the product and not checking in for, for a week, something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, discounts, offers, giving them incentives to take a decision by a certain date. That's mm -hmm. all really, really good stuff and valuable. Um, and, and, you know, you could also sort of play around the fact that if they weren't able to sort of take a decision or move forward, um, you know, how much information would they be missing if they didn't have a transcription tool? Um, so if they don't move forward, are they still going to have information that won't be computerized and transcribed and you know they'll still be making manual notes um but other than that eddie i think it was a pretty good call and um, good steps for you and if you were going to take one or two action steps for the next couple of weeks um to, to better improve you know what would those be yeah, so I, I think definitely having a more rigorous approach when it comes to uh, the end of the call and, you know, booking in those next steps to make sure that we have, um, you know, a time to work forward with. And also, yeah, maybe getting a little bit more um, granular with the questions when it comes to, as you mentioned there, you know, if you weren't to use Scenario, what, how would that impact your role? You know, how much um, time would be wasted, how much resource would be wasted, those internal and external um, uh, meetings, the communication in those meetings, would they be as beneficial by taking those manual notes or would it be improved by, you know, using Scenario and having that um, transcribed and all the action items and, and bits and pieces and tools and features that come with it? Absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, I'm going to throw it back to you, Sam, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Yeah. So um, 
Thank you so much, Ollie. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, I think as I'm going to dive into this in a little bit more detail, the main piece to kind of take from that is really the style in which that happened. And it wasn't Ollie giving direct feedback and saying, this is what you did wrong. And this is, it was very much Ollie helping Eddie to see those challenges on his own. And that kind of goes back to the training and the um, and the coaching hierarchy or, or the matrix is that coaching has to be based on some form of training. Uh, people can't be self-aware on what they're doing right or what they could be doing better if they don't have a framework on what that is based on. So if this was in the training conversation, it would probably be a lot more direct. Um, but in this case, it seems like, uh, and, and very clearly, Eddie has had a lot of good training and was able to identify those, uh, those, those potential challenges or uh, coaching opportunities himself. Um, so Eddie, just to, if you want to give a quick uh, uh, insight on how they can learn more about Scenario. Yeah, absolutely. If, if anyone is um, interested in, in learning more about Scenario and how we can um, kind of eradicate that manual note-taking process for you um, and have more insightful meetings, um, then yeah, contact us um, obviously via the website there. Um, you can book in anytime with me using the, the Calendly link and um, I'll be more than happy to chat with you further. Um, so to kind of start at the beginning, um, how do we create a coaching culture? The first thing that I want to return to is the idea of rewarding processes and not just results. Um, the way that I see it is, as, as I'm assuming the majority of people on this call are managing sales reps themselves or are a business owner or an entrepreneur, um, it's our accountability to really work backwards from whatever revenue goals we set ourselves. And then from there, we can start to build the processes to determine the activities that will lead to those results. Now, this is an this is a iterative process that will continue to improve, and we can start to identify what those things are. But the goal is, is that if our reps are following the training and they're following the coaching and they are uh, reaching out to the right number of people, to the, to the right people, to the right uh, number of times, um, we should expect the results um, that we have forecasted and predicted. And likewise, in actually hiring, that, that also goes back to making sure we're hiring uh, people that are uh, match the traits and characteristics that we deem as a successful salesperson. And I kind of look at it in a very similar analogy to poker. You know, you can get lucky with poker. You could, you could bet a very, very, you could go all in with a terrible hand because you've never played poker before and you could still technically win. It's a very low probability. And in the long term of you playing continual hands and continual games, you will eventually lose. And the same thing is true with sales. If we only re reward the results, um, there are instances where I have done um, a really bad job on a sales call and I haven't done uh, asked enough questions or built enough rapport and still closed the deal. In the same way, there's been instances where I've done all the right things and maybe the client um, dropped out at the last minute or something happened. Um, it's really important that I'm continually working on the processes and on the activities that in the long run and for the entire sales team over a long period of time will eventually lead to success. We don't want to reinforce bad habits that might, in some instances, lead to closes. So I like to reward results as a team and activities individually. We like to make sales fun, align with their goals. It should really always be about the salesperson. You should never care more about their success than they should. When we start to do that, that's when we start to fall into the management and the micromanagement. So they need to trust and enjoy the process. And the, while the trainer and the coach have to set the plan in the same way that if you're going to the gym, your trainer will, will outline what your meeting, uh, what your meal plan is and what your uh, training activities are, um, the, 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 the person going to the gym uh, in the same way the sales rep has to still do the work. And that's really important. That, that means that it's not the sales manager or the sales coach jumping in all of their calls and doing the closing for them. The sales rep needs to go out and do the work themselves. So to be a coach and not to be a manager is kind of the opposite of, of micromanaging, right? When you're a manager, when you, again, care more about their sales more than you, you care more about their sales than they do, you're reinforcing that they're doing it for you and not for themselves. And I, the best analogy I can think of is, as a recent grad is that when my parents would uh, micromanage me on me completing my essay and me studying for school, it actually made me more defensive and, and, and more resistant to actually studying because I felt like I was completing my degree for them and not for myself. Now, of course, they care about my success. In the same way as a coach and a manager, you want them to be successful, but you need to align with their goals and why they're here to succeed and why they want to you know, do their best. And managing is very much like, why aren't you hitting quota? What's your pipeline for the month? 
how many calls have you booked? And um, what we want to do as sales coaches, we want to detach from the outcome, be present in the moment, and most importantly, avoid judgment. When we can create an environment where our salespeople can be completely vulnerable and honest with us, and we can still celebrate the wins, regardless of how small they might seem, they are going to grow and they're going to develop because they're going to be authentic with you, right? If a sales rep says to you, you know what, I really messed up this call, I did all the wrong things versus hide it from you, you're actually able to coach them on it. If a sales rep goes, you know what, I've been feeling really demotivated, really. Whether they tell you or not, the feeling is still going to be there. They're still going to be feeling demotivated. So the fact that they're able to be open with you because you're not judging them means you can coach them and empower them to actually grow, to actually improve. So to a similar front, it's super important in coaching that we use questions in a way that proceed change. So when we use problem-focused questions, such as, you know, why do you keep making the same mistake or why do you keep doing this or, you know, why didn't you build rapport? What that does is it reinforces and it collects evidence as to why they can't succeed. And it confirms the negative beliefs that they might have about themselves instead of motivating and empowering them to believe and, and to grow their self-efficacy. Self-efficacy means how much do they believe they are able to take action and improve. We take that away when we focus solely on the problem instead of the solution. So instead of using words like mistakes, we can replace that with coachable moments. Instead of where did you go wrong, we might ask what might you do differently in the future. Instead of how can we get to, instead of asking what's stopping you from succeeding or what's stopping you from closing this deal, ask them what can we do or how can we get you to that place. Um, some examples are really like, what's wrong with me or you? What's the lesson here? What did I slash you do well? And by the way, this doesn't just apply to sales coaching. This applies to coaching in general, in all aspects of the business. Instead of why do I keep messing this up? What needs to change? How can we get this right next time? And similarly, you know, what's needed to, what's needed to be done to succeed? What new possibilities can be created here? So to dive into this, into kind of, the real, the nitty gritty of this from a psychological perspective, and I'm actually writing my master's thesis on, on all of this, is we've got to look at it from a perspective of behavioral change. So we have the, 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 the cycle or the direction of changes in an individual, and this is in general, this isn't just in sales, this is just an ability to make a decision and to grow, whether that's stopping a bad habit, whether that's um, having a diet, whether that's, um, or whether that's, um, you know, making more dials on the phone, um, we start with that pre-contemplation before we even think about doing it. We might identify there's a problem, but we have no intention on doing anything. We might start to think about doing it. We might start preparing an action step. Okay, this is what I want to do. We then take that action. Okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start watching my sales recordings. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to stop eating. Um, I'm going to stop drinking orange juice as a way of, of, of helping my diet. And then maintenance and actually consisting with that change. And when it comes to sales, the closing happens at the maintenance part, not even at the action part, right? Because if you close a client and then they actually drop out, that's kind of a loss. So maintenance is super important. So a way to get them through that is to use an approach called motivational interviewing. So what this is, is actually a counseling approach. It's used in therapy. Um, and it's a directive client-centered counseling style that actually elicits behavior change by helping people to explore and resolve what ambivalence and uncertainty they might have in navigating through that behavior change. So we do this by engaging, right? So instead of fixing the problem, we focus on um, understanding the problem or understanding um, where the problem needs to be solved. We engage with them. Um, we focus, so we target the behavior that is important to the client. So we make it about the client, again, making it about what they want to do what's important to them, what are their goals, evoking. And this is about intrinsic motivation. This is about not being the expert, not telling them what to do, but helping them understand where are they the most confident, what are their strengths, and how will that motivate them to actually believe in themselves to take the next steps. And then planning is reinforcing language and the readiness to change, actually reinforcing what are the next steps, how can you make those next steps. Um, so what we actually use in that, we use four key techniques, right? O-A-R-S. O stands for open-ended questioning, right? Tell me more about, 
how questions instead of did you or could you or are, right? Affirmative statements, recognizing and reinforcing success, really, really important. Expressing optimism, right? It takes a lot of strength to be open about the fact that you're struggling in this particular sales call. I really appreciate you sharing with the sales call because it was a difficult call, right? I really appreciate the fact that you are still gritty despite having a lot of no-shows recently. Again, it pushes that motivation and that self-efficacy. Reflective statements, um, mirroring back, sounds like, it seems like, if I'm hearing you correctly. And then finally, summarizing everything that you're hearing. Now, this technique isn't just used in, in, in coaching. It's also used in sales itself. So we actually use this technique. We train our sales reps in motivational interviewing because in the same way coaching is about leading people to make their own change for themselves, we don't tell the prospect to buy our problem, to buy our solution. We help them to understand why they need it by asking them questions, consulting them. So we're going to do a, a quick run through of what that actually looks like in practice. So Savannah, if you want to uh, unmute and uh, we can jump right in. Yeah, of course. So Savannah, what's something that you uh, feel particularly stuck in right now? Yeah, I would say right now I'm feeling a little stuck in refocusing the conversation with clients from pricing to the value. Okay, so it sounds like you're struggling at refocusing uh, the challenge around pricing into the value of what the product uh, is that you're selling. Yeah. Got you. And, and how long have you been trying to, uh, to solve for this challenge? Um, probably around a month. Okay. And um, on a scale of uh, zero to 10, how confident do you feel about solving for this challenge when it comes to pricing? Right now, I would say I'm about a seven. Okay. Well, a seven is, is pretty good, right? That's, uh, that's a lot higher than, let's say, uh, a one or a two. So, so how come you gave yourself a seven and, and not a lower score like one or a two? Yeah, so I've been working on this for the month so far. So I've given myself a seven because I've done some internal work with um, role playing and with my peers just to practice tone and confidence to hopefully um, build a better tone when presenting the pricing and getting more confident with my skills uh, leading up to that. Right, right. So it sounds like you're really focusing right now on your tonality and you've put in some work into listening to your recordings as a way of, of identifying where you might be going wrong and, and, and what you can do differently. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, so where might, you, where might you rate yourself? So if I asked you this question a month ago, when you just started to have this challenge, where would you have rated yourself then on the same scale? I probably scale? would have said a two. <laughs> okay, oh, wow. So that's, that's a lot of growth. So um, yeah, that's some big improvement. So what do you think helped you to move from a two to a seven? Yeah, so the biggest thing that helped me was the role playing and hearing how other people um, on my team presented their own sales and pitched their own. And then also hearing other people's tones with different types of clients um, to get more confident with the different types of people you encounter. And um, it's helped me with my confidence as well, which I think is a bigger factor in actually getting the deals to close. I'm with you. So, so taking some lessons from other reps, sort of really digging into what they might be doing that's working for them and then mm -hmm. sort of bringing that on board. And that seems to have been working quite well for you. Yeah. Um, where would you like to be on the same scale if I asked you this question in a month from today? I would love to be at a 10. <laughs> awesome. All right, great. I love that. Um, and how would that make you feel? How would you feel about this if you were able to get to that 10 in a month? Yeah, if I think I was, if I could get to a 10, then I think that my confidence would really increase in my own sales skills. And then I think that that is my biggest challenge within this. So if I get more comfortable with um, just in general, presenting the value and the pricing, then I think that my confidence would increase, which could lead me to close a lot of the deals that I've been struggling with in the past and identify some challenges earlier to sell them on the value rather than um, getting stuck with the pricing. Got you, got you, got you. It sounds like you'll feel a lot more confident, which will in turn lead to, to more success in your closing ability, just yeah. by focusing a little bit more on value. Um, so what ideas do you have to bring yourself closer um, from a seven to, to a 10? 
Yeah, I think some specialized role playing um, pertaining to value and just how learning how to present value, getting tips from my coaches and other people on my team as well definitely will help. And I think that just watching other people's recorded calls to see how their um, live calls go with clients would really help me get more comfortable with it and learn from others. Brilliant, brilliant. Awesome. So that's some really, really good, good ideas. So I, I, I guess, Savannah, what would be the potential first next step that we can work on together to help you get there to get to that point? Yeah, I definitely think that some role playing with you um, with when like a potential client is hesitant about pricing or just some role playing where the client's a bit tricky um, to give me some challenges and maybe make me a little bit more comfortable and having some um, feedback on that would definitely help. I'm with you. Great, great. So just to summarize everything that I've heard so far, it sounds like the challenge that you're having at the moment is, is around um, pricing and seeing that as an objection and, and, and struggling to build value. However, you've done some work on listening to your recordings, um, watching some other recordings, seeing how the difference in tonality and conviction has affected the pricing slide, but also knowing how to build more value, maybe in the question asking stage. Um, you feel confident that you're able to get to a 10 and, and, and feel really good about it. The things that we kind of need to work on, it sounds like, is focusing on doing some more role plays around these specific areas and uh, and hopefully building your confidence there so that you feel more confident when you're giving the pricing. Is that, am, am I hearing you correctly? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So, so thank you so much, Savannah. That was great. Um, so, so what we're doing here in motivational interviewing is, is we're really focusing on motivating Savannah's self-efficacy and belief that she can actually improve. Um, and this can get more difficult because some people really are like, I'm really stuck. I really don't know what to do. And what we want to do is instead of being like, okay, I'm going to tell all the answers. The first step we need to do as coaches is be like, you know more than you think you know. And you have more potential than you realize. And by doing that, changing that mindset is really, really important. Again, if I asked the same question, I said, instead of um, what do we need to do to help you get there? And instead I asked her, which many, many salespeople and sales managers might ask is, what is stopping you from getting there? Because if I know what's stopping you from getting there, I can solve that, that whatever that blockage is. The problem is, is I'm reminding Savannah what those barriers are. And we want to be able to overcome those barriers by focusing on what she can do today, right now. And how can we work together collaboratively so that if I'm not here, I'm on vacation for a week. Savannah's developed the tools and the skills to be able to improve on this herself without needing my direction and answers on everything. So that was really, really good. So thank you so much, Savannah. And, and here are some coaching questions. I'm not going to go through all of these because I am going to share this resource with everyone. Um, but we have what I would describe as on a typical coaching call, we start with the opening, what you'd like to discuss, what the biggest issue is, clarifying the topic, um, exploring what that issue is, um, discussing potential ways around the solution. Again, how would you advise yourself to do it? Um, and then taking actions and next steps. So to get access to all of these documents, um, feel free to use this QR code. Um, uh, if someone could drop it in the chat as well, that'd be great. Um, and uh, you can download all these resources. We've got the coaching worksheet, which is, I think it's around 20 questions you can use in a coaching call and not just in sales, but in everything. Um, the role play log, um, which is what you can use on those actual live sales recordings, uh, an ebook on growing a remote sales team and a, tr a sales training ebook. Um, I do want to share, I'm going to leave that for a minute, um, just, to, just in case you guys are scanning that. And I'm going to pass it over to Savannah to share a little bit more into us and what we do. Yeah, so a little bit more about us and Apprentice. So in general, if you're looking to get some help on a variety of different areas in your business, for example, business development, marketing, or operations, what we do is we provide you with a senior consulting apprentice like myself, who will manage an entire team of Rockstar apprentices from Ivy League schools. And those apprentices will work at the top consulting firms and investment banks when they graduate. We know that they're super successful. Um, but today they could work on your business challenges and help you grow. So we're offering a discount of 50% off your first month if you're looking to get started in the next four weeks or so. So definitely feel free to use the QR code or link um, that we will put in the chat um, to book a call with one of our reps to learn a little bit more. And I'm going to put the link in the chat now. Awesome. And thank you so much. So while we keep that up um, for just a moment, um, 
if any questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, we would love to answer what, what questions you have on anything that we've shared so far. So I have got one. Any advice about adjusting our coaching styles to fit new generation workers like Gen Zs? They like texting and YouTube, for example. It's actually a really, really good question because I think that the main thing to understand with coaching is, is, it's, is it's, um, it's, it's, what's the word you can say? It's individually focused, right? Because coaching style depends on who it is that you are coaching. That's why it's coaching. That's why it's collaborative. And um, I would love to. I would love to kind of get your insights on that, Ollie, um, on 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 what you think. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd say to take a step back, you actually need to understand the person. So, um, you know, if if it is a, a Gen Z worker, let's say that you're hiring, um, you know, who are they? Are they introverted? Are they extroverted? Um, and what do they tend to use most in the day to day role? So. A lot of Gen Zs will prefer SMS, they'll use WhatsApp, and they tend to use Slack and sort of software apps rather than emails just because they respond quicker. Um, and stuff like YouTube, for example, that can always pivot to um, how do I reach Gen Zs as, as an audience um, because they would typically use different apps and social medias compared to um, sort of people that aren't in, in that Jay-Z, Gen Z role. Um, and I think with coaching style, what I found um, to sort of experience share, what I found really, really successful is just being on their level, being personal, um, not coaching from a manager to an employee and sort of saying, I've been here for so long, this is how you should do it. And kind of throwing the rule book and the script out of the window, being on the level, um, being in the trenches and putting yourself in their shoes with them. And I think they'll really appreciate that because they're coming into the business, they're new, um, and they'd want to get coaching that is sort of for beginners rather than you telling them and directing them what to do. So I hope that helped. Brilliant. Yeah, I love that for sure. And we, we, we definitely have been using um, like Slack channels as a way to post those resources too, YouTube videos, um, ebooks, guides, um, and it also creates that culture as well. What I love even more is when our sales reps do it themselves. They found something on YouTube, they found a podcast, and then they recommend it. Uh, what if I wanted to create this model for talent I secured to support my business? Do you provide training for my own team? Um, uh, we don't. That's that's that we we're, we're not um, we don't do training. Um, we do provide training for our own team. However, we have got tons of resources that are available if you would like to use them. And of course, um, if you want to book time with anyone from our team, you can always do that. We believe in good karma, We're all about helping uh, businesses grow. So if there's anything I can do to help support them, you know, feel free to my calendar link itself is apprenticechat.com. Um, so if you want to book time with me, I'm happy to discuss, but we do provide the team and we train them and bet them ourselves. Awesome. I think that might be it. Um, I guess we'll move on to the next slide uh, and, I'll, and I'll hand it over to you, uh, Edison, if you want to um, uh, provide some, Edward, if you want to provide some detail on Sonera and how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, no, thanks to all three of you for, for today as well. This has been really insightful and I've really enjoyed it. Um, definitely going to use the the tips that you've um, mentioned there, Ollie, moving forward. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, of course, if you wanted to learn more about Sonero, um, I know we briefly touched on it in the middle of this presentation here, um, but I would love to chat further. Um, I have provided my um, Canly link um, in, in the chat there. So book in any time with me. If for whatever reason that link's not working for you, um, I think there was, there was one member in there it wasn't working for, um, then just send me an email and I can set up um, a time for us to speak. Um, but yeah, would love to chat further. And thanks very much, guys. Awesome. And I think that just about wraps it up. So thank you so much uh, for joining today. Um, again, um, really, really enjoyed this, and I hope you found this valuable. Um, we certainly have and use it in our organization. So feel free to share the record when it goes out to anyone that you know that might also find it valuable. And of course, uh, feel free to stay in touch with all of us. I uh, would love to hear how this is working for you. And if there's any advice or anything that we can offer to you guys, we'd absolutely love to do that. So thank you again, um, and wish you all a wonderful 4th of July weekend and a wonderful rest of your day. All the best. <laughs>